Well, we're glad this week to have uh, with us, uh, first of all, Brother Les Butler, and he has been a blessing. And each night about this time, I did this yesterday, and I want to take just a minute and do this tonight just before he ministers to us in song. This church started out in a storefront building 43 year, 44 years in November. And when we moved on this property, the building next door, we had, a, we had a series of meetings. My pastor came and preached and a spirit of revival broke out and we had, didn't have to, but we desired to extend it uh, a few days and God just blessed. But you know, I, I'm, I'm afraid that very few people in our country really understand and know what a revival really consists of. I wish we could see it again. I wish we could experience it again. But I've studied a lot and read a lot about the Welsh revivals. I've been just giving us a little excerpt before the services. What did a revival look like in Wales? A newspaper reporter who attended some of those services gave us a bird's eye view of what he discovered when he attended one of those churches participating in the Welch Revival. From about 1867 on up to 1905, thousands of people were saved. Tens of thousands of people from 1867. A newspaper reporter heard about things happening there and he decided to go over and write a column for their newspaper. Here's what he reported, being in the middle of a revival meeting. The scene was almost indescribable. Tier upon tier of men and women filled every inch of space. Those who could not gain admittance stood outside and listened at the doors. Others rushed to the windows where almost every word was audible. When at seven o'clock the service began, 2,000 people were present. The enthusiasm was unbounded. Women sang and shouted till the perspiration ran down their faces. And men jumped up one after the other to testify. One told in quivering accent the story of a drunken life. A working man spoke like a practiced orator. And one can imagine what a note the testimony of a converted Egyptian, a gypsy woman struck when, dressed in her best, she told of her reformation and repentance. At 10 o'clock, the meeting had lost none of its ardor. Prayer after prayer went up from those Welch hearts with almost dreary persistence. Time and again, the four ministers who stood in the pulpit attempting to start a hymn, but it was all in vain. The revival had taken hold of the people, and even Evan Roberts cannot hold it in check. His latest convert is a policeman who, after complaining that people had gone mad after religion so that there was nothing to do, went to see for himself and bursting into tears, confessed the error of his ways and repented. That's what happens when revival tarries. Let's pray tonight that God will give us a taste of that. Amen, brother. Until uh, the man that was praying over the, uh, over the offering started lifting up the precious name of Jesus, I knew what I needed to start off with. Oh, how sweet the name of Jesus, how it calms my doubts and fears and how it fills my soul with glory when that lovely name I hear 
Oh, clouds roll back and the sun starts shining. Pain and heartache just disappear. My burden's lighter and the day is brighter when that lovely name I hear. At the very, very thought of Jesus, all earthly treasures, they grow strangely dim. For all my longings and all my searchings, I found them all. When I found him and the clouds roll back and the sun starts shining, pain and heartache, they just disappear. My burden's lighter and the day is brighter. When that lovely name I hear, when that lovely, when that lovely, yes, when that lovely name I hear. Brother Hamlin asked me sometime this week to kind of elaborate on my testimony and sing one song in particular for him. I want to take that opportunity now. Brother Beatty was talking about the uh, time that I spent in the hospital with COVID and ICU and uh, doctor on the left side at the foot of the bed, arguing with the nurse on the right side of the foot of my bed about ordering a ventilator and how uh, the doctor was telling the nurse that he didn't think that I was going to make it out of there alive. And that was about three years ago or so. And uh, even after things turned around, and they did, to God be the glory, uh, and I got to leave the hospital, I left in an ambulance. They took me home in an ambulance. They took me home uh, on a stretcher, put me in my bed, and I didn't move for weeks. And had, uh, they basically made a, a, a hospital room in my bedroom and uh, couldn't, couldn't even sit up on the side of the bed for, uh, again, for, for months. And... Uh, it was a tough time, but God was sure present, my word. I had some of the greatest church services in my life in that ICU. I had uh, my iPad with me, and I just had singing and preaching going on 24 hours a day, seven days a week, the whole time I was there. Everybody that came into my room, be it a doctor, a nurse, a technician, or those cleaning the floor, heard the gospel 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And even whenever I couldn't, uh, I couldn't hardly talk, couldn't do, do anything, there'd be a song that would come up that God orchestrated all of it. He just orchestrated it all, the music that came and the, and the messages. And uh, I would get to worshiping. And I would, when I, even when I couldn't say anything, I'd, I'd hit that hit a thing by the side of my bed just to say, thank you, Lord. It was my way of shouting and giving him glory and honor when I couldn't do it with my voice. And I'd have doctors and nurses come in with me making that rack and they'd say, what in the world is going on with you? And I'd try to get out in the little squeaky voice that I could. I'm having church come on in. I had texts from literally around the world. When I was in there, people saying that they were praying for me. And there was no doubt that they were. If anybody says that they've never felt the prayers of God's people, I, I, I can't say that because I have. 
I have felt them. And it's one of the least used in our arsenal as a Christian, prayer. And it should be right up on the top shelf. Praying to a holy God who can do anything that you ask and abundantly more than we ask. And I'm thankful for the prayers of God's people and I'm thankful for th- the fact that there is power in prayer. And I'm a matter of fact, quickly, let me say this. I want to take this opportunity to ask you to pray for a friend of mine. Just before I walked out the door to meet Brother Hamlin tonight, I got a message that one of my, uh, uh, one of my very best friends, Rick Francis is his name, is in the hospital in ICU and they have no idea what's wrong with him. And the post that I saw certainly looked bleak. I've been there. And the thing that people did for me back then, I'm going to do my best to do on his behalf tonight. And I'm asking you to do the same, to please pray for Rick Francis. Somewhere, somebody is praying tonight for a loved one who's wandered away from the light I've got him all but faith reaches heaven and God is aware and forever is changed in one moment of prayer oh there's power in prayer Power to spare all that you'll ever need is waiting right there. A few words, just a little child's faith, and it's goodbye despair. Oh, there's power, so much power. There's power in prayer. Here's my story. Pray for Rick while you're listening. A bed holds a body and it's periled with pain. The doctors have tried, but hope is in vain. Oh, but wait. Someone's praying in the midst of the gloom when all at once the great physician steps into the room. Oh, there's power in prayer, power to spare all that you'll ever need is waiting right there a few words a little child's faith and it's goodbye despair oh there's power so much power there's power in prayer a few words just a little child's faith And it's goodbye despair, oh, there's power, so much power, there's power in prayer. Brother Les, would you wait just a moment before you leave? I got one other one I'd like for you to do. Yes, sir. The first one you did today uh, for the school. First one I did today. Kind of wake them up. Help me, Lord. Oh, the instrumental. Yes, sir. Okay. Could you do that one for us? Oh, can I do it? Okay. Yeah, all right. All right. (laughs) Here we go.
Everybody awake? Amen. We're ready for preaching. Thank God for the good music tonight. Brother John Hamlin, thank you. Thank you, Pastor. You too. You too. I'm grateful for our fundamental heritage and our fundamental history. You probably don't know it, but our brother that sang, there's a fountain filled with blood. That special just a few moments ago, that was the hymn of invitation that was always given at the Great Emanuel Baptist Church in Pontiac, Michigan, where my mentor, Dr. Tom Malone Sr., pastored for decades. And every invitation at the Emanuel Baptist Church, my brother, the special that you sang and blessed our heart, and thank you, choir, for the great job that you did as well, that was the hymn that was sung for the invitation. And then a moment ago, as Brother Butler was uh, playing Keep on the Firing Line, that was first sung in a Billy Sunday tabernacle, in a Billy Sunday meeting. Yesterday uh, afternoon, between the services, we went and got a bite to eat, and we stopped in Thomasville and saw that uh, chair that's in uh, the metropolis of Thomasville, right downtown. And uh, I believe in 1925, my hero, Billy Sunday, was preaching in a tobacco warehouse and uh, posed for a picture on top of that chair. And uh, Brother Butler just played Keep on the Firing Line, and that was first sung, as I made mention, in a Billy Sunday meeting. I said all that, say this, um, I'm thankful. I'm uh, grateful for the heritage that we have as fundamentalists. And uh, you just put it down in your little book, I'm not recovering. I'm uh, remaining, and I'm rejoicing, and I'm recruiting. That's exactly what I'm doing. Thank you, choir, for the great singing. My brother, thank you, and Brother Butler, what a blessing, what a blessing. Thank you so much. As I was hearing all the singing tonight, I couldn't help but think there's nowhere in the world, big statement, Nowhere in the world that you could have heard what we are privileged to hear tonight. And I've been blessed by the special music. Talking about Billy Sunday, he used to say, bad church music, bad church music is as worthless as a glass eye at a keyhole. <laughs> Billy Sunday used to say that. And that's about how I feel in regards to bad church music. The book of Daniel chapter 5, please stay seated. I want to make a couple introductory comments and then I'll have you stand and I'll read my text. On the book table, uh, there is uh, a message that uh, I've preached all across America. It's been on television as well, America in the shadow of Calvary. And uh, I preached it back in 2021 in the National Sword of the Lord Conference on Revival and Soul Winning. It has been captured on compact disc. It's on the book table, and I trust that you'll get it. Also on the book table is uh, this devotional uh, published by the Sword of the Lord as well, entitled Neology. Now, uh, everything on the book table is sermonic. And by that I mean it's things that I have preached. It's things that I am preaching. But this is the only thing on the book table that is not sermonic, it is a 31-day devotional on prayer. And the goal of neology is to take all of our prayer lives to the next level. Wouldn't you like to get, the pl get to the place? Wouldn't you like to get to the place? I know that I would. Where a sermon on prayer, a song on prayer, a scripture on prayer does not convict us for our lack of prayer. I'd like to get to that place sometime in my Christian life. And so the goal of neology in 31 days is to take all of our prayer lives to the next level. I deliberately, Dr. Beatty, laid it out in such a way that uh, day one is just when you start neology. And uh, 31 days, you can go through the devotional. I make a statement about prayer. I give you a quote from one of the giants that are gone about that truth, a Bible verse, and then no more than three paragraphs on that thought. And then at the end of the 31 days, I show you how you can make a prayer covenant with the Lord. Also sprinkled throughout neology are some of my favorite hymns on prayer. 
And then in the very back, there is the message, why the believer ought to pray that I have literally preached all across the country. And so the goal of neology is to take all of our prayer lives to the next level. You've heard of theology, the study of the nature of God. Well, neology is just a basic devotional on prayer. I know churches that have literally, Dr. Beatty, bought boxes of these, and uh, there's not uh, hardly a week that goes by, but what I get, uh, an email or a text message, or someone will call and say that neology has absolutely revolutionized their prayer life. It is on the book table, and I hope that you'll take advantage and get it. Also brand new, never been offered in any other meeting, it's not even on my website yet, is the message a call to old time preaching. This is preached with a burden. It is published with a burden. Dr. Beatty, one of your good men, as we were coming in, Brother Butler and I tonight, uh, stopped us and said, I read it last night. I couldn't put it down. I, I didn't want to put it down, but I couldn't put it down. And it's just uh, preached and published from the burden that uh, we just need to get back to old time preaching. Nothing wrong in America. But what could be made right by old-fashioned, red-hot, spirit-filled Bible preaching? I don't know if there's ever been a day where there's been so much discussion about preaching and so less old-time preaching than has ever gone on. And so I want you to get it. I don't uh, pull any punches. It's just uh, unvarnished truth. I want you to get it. In fact, I'd encourage you to get two. Uh, one for yourself and one to give away. And if you get it tonight, I will, th I will throw in the card seven basic leadership lessons from a Baptist leader. You know, there is a uh, buzzword. It's called uh, spiritual leadership. And you hear it all the time, spiritual leadership, spiritual leadership. It's like a buzzword, spiritual leadership. But there's something that's greater than spiritual leadership, and it is scriptural leadership. And so I deal with just the seven basic leadership lessons that are, pardon me, scriptural from a Baptist leader. And so uh, if you'll get uh, uh, called old time preaching tonight, I will, I will throw that in and I know it will be a blessing. Book of Daniel chapter number five, I would invite you to stand with me as I read the word of God, Daniel chapter five. And verse number six, thank you, those of you that are visiting, that are with us in the revival meeting. We appreciate it. And we are grateful for those that uh, are watching online. And thank you so much for being in this revival meeting by way of modern technology. In fact, for those of you that are watching right now online, if, uh, if the cameraman can give me a tight headshot, would you do that? Bring it in, bring it in, bring it in, tight headshot, tighter, 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 bring it in, bring it in. Okay, for those of you that are watching right now online, if you'll send us $5, we'll send you a vial of holy oil. <laughs> Not really, but I've always wanted to do that. Book of Daniel, chapter number five, and I'll take but one verse of scripture for our text, and it will be verse number 16. I have heard of thee, that thou canst make interpretations and dissolve doubts. If thou canst read the writing and make known to me the interpretation thereof, thou shalt be clothed with scarlet and have a chain of gold about thy neck and shalt be the third ruler in the kingdom. Just a handful of days ago, while reading my Bible, I came across a phrase in this verse that absolutely latched upon my heart. I've underlined it in my Bible, and you may want to underscore it in yours, and it's those words, and dissolve doubts. You see it. There it is, and dissolve doubts. And for a few moments, I want to speak to you on the subject tonight the AKA, the also known as, I want today. Huh. 
Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we're grateful for this opportunity to stand behind a sacred desk to preach the Word of God. If I know my heart, I want to be a blessing. But the only way that I can be is if you hide me behind the cross and fill me with the Spirit. Place a hedge around this great church by the blood of Christ to keep the devil and his demons from hindering this service. Save the sinner and stir the saint. Heavenly Father, for all that you'll do in our midst and even in our hearts tonight, we will be careful to give you all the praise and honor and glory. Bless and protect my precious family as I am away. Give us fresh, warm bread from the oven of heaven to feed from tonight. Lord, I'd request, oh, how I would request that you'd clothe me in my calling. For we ask these things in Jesus' name, and for his sake, amen. You may be seated in every hour of Bible, world, and church history. God has had someone or several someones that were considerable heroes and heroines. They were given monikers that matched their mission. Abraham was called the friend of God. Winston Churchill was called the bulldog. And Charles Haddon Spurgeon was called the prince of preachers. But in this present time, which is marked by the prevailing trend of so much faithlessness and faltering, my mind is made up to model the prophet of past times. The AKA, the also known as I Want Today. In the book of Daniel, chapter 5, we find King Belshazzar's appeal to the prophet Daniel. Now, this chapter could be easily or effortlessly outlined like this the ball, verse 1, the gall, verses 2 through 4, the wall, verses 5 through 6. The call, verses 7 through 29, and then the fall, verses 30 through 31. It is well the prophet Daniel is dealing under the direct inspiration of the Holy Spirit with the call that a person hears echoing down the corridors of bygone centuries from a godless banqueting hall to a grotesque, morally bankrupt hour and often unnoticed moniker for a man of God. Verse 16, and I've heard of thee, that thou canst make interpretations and watch it now and dissolve doubts. And dissolve doubts. And dissolve doubts. Now, if thou canst read the writing, and make known to me the interpretation thereof, thou shalt be clothed with scarlet, and have a chain of gold about thy neck, and shalt be the third ruler in the kingdom. More times than not, Brother uh, Butler, King Belshazzar's eternal statement about Brother Daniel and dissolve doubts is missed because of the temporal swag bag that came with the interpretation of the monarch's dream. Now, if you don't know what a swag bag is, it is interesting in the margin of the Hamlin Reference Bible, there's a note and it says a swag bag is the Mr. T starter kit. <laughs> it basically means the removal of reservations. One Bible student once wrote about our text, we live just now uh, in a specially doubting age. He went on to write, science puts everything in question 
and literature distills the questions, making an atmosphere of them. The cultured uh, and mature have doubts uh, ingrown that they know not how, and the younger minds encounter their public visitations when they do not seek them. The sister verse of Daniel 5, 16 is 1 Peter 3, 15. And as you've heard me say any number of times in any number of services, every verse, every verse in the Bible has what I call a sister verse. And often that sister verse will throw more light upon the verse that you're musing, meditating, or making a study of. Again, the sister verse of Daniel 5, 16 is 1 Peter 3, 15. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh your reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. Never forget the duty of the child of God in this dark hour is by their word, walk, and work to be constantly putting not question marks but exclamation points on their word, a walk, and work. If you miss everything that I preach tonight, I pray that you would not miss that. And it even bears repeating the duty, the duty, the duty of the child of God in this dark hour is by their word, walk, and work to be constantly putting not question marks, but exclamation points on their word, walk, and work. Friend, you and I, those of us that are saved, uh, need to know the DNA, the scriptural model that will give the AKA, the spiritual moniker of Brother Daniel. And dissolve doubts. And dissolve doubts. And dissolve doubts. What a phrase. What a statement. Uh, what uh, a line in the Bible, and dissolve doubts. Man, that's the AKA that I want today, and I trust when I finish preaching tonight, it'll be the AKA that you want as well. Quickly, tonight there are five daily dynamics from the life of Brother Daniel that made him a dissolver of doubts. You may want to take out a pencil and somewhere in your Bible scratch these things down. But my, how it would be far better if God were to take an eternal pen and write these things upon my heart and upon your heart as well. The AKA that I want today. Number one, his consecration. Daniel 1, 8, but Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with a portion of the king's meat nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore he requested of the prince of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. A dynamic of Daniel's daily life that made him a dissolver of doubts was his consecration. In Daniel 1.8, uh, God tells us that Daniel of old understood without question that when one devotes themselves to the heavenly cause, it touches all areas of their life, dress, demeanor, destinations, delicacies, diet, and even drink. Dr. John R. Rice once wrote about this scene in Scripture. Daniel resolved to live a clean, godly life and from what we can read in scriptures, he appears for the most part to achieve this. Most all of the great men of the Bible had glaring faults recorded, but Dr. Rice wrote, none were recorded of Daniel. In other words, I'd put it like this. He may have lived in the Babylonian captivity, but the Babylonian culture didn't capture or claim him. Is it any wonder that the songwriter would take the songwriter's pen and place upon songwriter's paper those soul penetrating words, dare to be a Daniel, dare to stand alone, 
Dare to have a purpose firm. Dare to make it known. Friend, you and I need to know that the DNA that will give the AKA dissolver of doubts of Brother Daniel is his consecration. The Bible says in 1 Peter 1, 15, but as he which hath called you is holy, so be holy in all manner of conversation. Mark it down. Don't think you'll make a difference till in every 24 hours of every day you're different and you don't care who knows it. Now I'm not being harsh. God knows my heart. But I believe we don't have enough fingers and toes to count in our fundamental churches those who don't mind being different. They don't mind being distinct. I don't have fingers and toes, neither do you, to count those in our fundamental churches that don't mind being different and don't mind being distinct. But here is the problem. They don't want anybody to know it. They don't want anybody to be aware of it. They don't want anybody uh, to have knowledge of it. But friend, excuse me while I preach for a moment. It doesn't work that way. If you and I are going to be different, if you, oh my, I feel a preaching storm getting ready to break in here tonight. Really, I do. If you and I are going to be distinct, guess what? We can't be different in a cave. We can't be distinct uh, on the back side of the moon. Somebody is going to know about it. And that is not a bad thing. That is a Bible thing. Many years ago now, you'll find it interesting, Brother Butler, musicians noted that errand boys in a certain part of London all whistled out of tune as they went about their work. Uh, as it was talked about, someone suggested uh, it was because the bells of Westminster were slightly out of tune. Something had gone wrong with the chimes uh, and they were discordant. The boys uh, did not know there was anything wrong with the peals and quite unconsciously they copied their pitch. Hey child of God, our whistle, our whistle. Hey child of God, our whistle will always be out of pitch with this wicked world because we're in pitch with a heavenly bell and that heavenly bell is the chime of consecration and dissolve doubts and dissolve doubts and dissolve doubts. Man, that's the AKA the also known as that I want today a dissolver of doubts. His consecration. Number two, let me hasten his cooperation. Daniel 2, 17, then Daniel went to his house and made the thing known to Hananiah, Mishael, Azariah, his companions. A dynamic of Daniel's daily life that, that made him a dissolver of doubts was his cooperation. In Daniel 2, 17, God tells us that Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego weren't just passing peers uh, on a Bible page, but were believable pals. In so much that when Daniel learns about King Belshazzar's dream that he couldn't recall, and how if the wise men of that day <laughs> couldn't reveal it, they would all be pushing up daisies. He has a powwow at his place. The Holy Spirit puts this truth with the pen of inspiration and we see it on the page of preservation in two words, his companions. Friend, you and I need to know that the DNA that will give the AKA dissolver of doubts of Brother Daniel is his cooperation. Now, there are several ways that God's people showcase their teamwork down at the church house. And listen, we can't say too much about teamwork in the house of God. We just can't overemphasize it. We, we just can't talk about it enough. 
My, I think about the choir that sang tonight and sang all day yesterday and how they blessed our hearts. You know what that was? That wasn't just great singing and that wasn't just uh, setting the spiritual atmosphere for the service. I know that's what it is, but it's a little bit more than that. It was a walking, talking, living, breathing, <laughs> singing, uh, their example to you and I of teamwork. Again, you can't say too much. And I can't say too much about uh, teamwork in uh, the house of God. But there are several uh, uh, ways that God's people will showcase uh, their teamwork down at the house of God. First of all, they draw the same enemies. <laughs> Daniel 2, 13, and they sought Daniel and his fellows to be slain. Uh, a way that God's people showcase their teamwork down at the house of God is they draw the same enemies. A biblical stand not only uh, brings the right friends, but it also brings the right foes too. Now here's my question. Why is it that you say that you stand like I stand, but you don't have the enemies that I have? <laughs> don't bow your head. We're nowhere near closing in prayer time. Why is it that you say that you stand where Dr. Beatty stands, but you don't have the enemies Dr. Beatty has? It's interesting to me that when you and I have a clear stand, when you and I have a concise stand, uh, when you and I there stand, that we're, we're not only going to draw the same friends, but we're going to draw the same foes as well. Oh, listen, what's going to happen uh, is uh, they draw the same enemy. Secondly, they desire the same enablement. Daniel 2, 18, that they would desire mercies of the God of heaven concerning this secret. Oh, listen, a, a way that will showcase God's people working together down at the church house uh, uh, as they desire the same enablement. Nobody serves God for any uh, length of time until they realize they need that divine strength and they need that divine spirit and they need that divine supply. I can't do it in my strength and you can't do it in your strength and none of us can do it in any of our strength. We need that help that comes from heaven. Amen. What showcases God's people working together there down at the house of God uh, is uh, uh, they desire the same enablement. Thirdly, they demand the same end. Daniel 2, 23, I thank thee and praise thee O oh, thou God of my fathers. Oh, a way that God's people showcase their teamwork at the church house is they demand the same end. The mission is always the same. The mission is always the same. I'm stuck. The mission is always the same. Maximum glory for the master. It's not praising me. It's not praising you. It's not praising us. It's praising the one that is worthy of all honor and glory and whoop goes right there praise and it's Jesus oh that every single individual that was in this service uh, and watching by way of internet and listening by way of radio and I don't know getting it by smoke signal would understand uh, that the th ways uh, that our cooperation our teamwork uh, is showcased uh, at the church house uh, is we there draw the same enemies we desire the same enablement and we demand the same end. See, you get mad because you picked up a piece of paper and you thought Dr. Beatty saw it and should have devoted last week's church bulletin to you. It's not about you. It's not about me. It's not about us. It's not about us being seen. It's not about us being recognized. Someone once said, if you really want to find out if you're serving the Lord, then let someone treat you like a servant and see how you respond. <laughs> a dissolver of doubts. Wow. 
Man, I don't know how many times I've preached from the book of Daniel. I don't know how many times I've read the book of Daniel. I don't know how many times uh, I've quoted a verse out of the book of Daniel. But right recently, Brother Sturgill, I saw those words, and dissolve doubts, and dissolve doubts, and dissolve doubts. Man, that's what I want to do. That's the AKA that I want to have today. I want to be a dissolver of doubts. And friend, I believe that you do as well. And the only way that's going to happen happen is if we have his cooperation. Why it was Benjamin Franklin, uh, one of our nation's founding fathers uh, who said uh, uh, we must indeed all hang together or most assuredly we shall all hang separately. His cooperation. Number three, his communication. Daniel 6.10, now when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, he went into his house and his windows being opened in his chamber uh, toward Jerusalem, he kneeled upon his knees three times a day and prayed. A dynamic of Daniel's daily life that made him a dissolver of doubts was his communication. In Daniel 6.10, God tells us that the jealous officials at King Darius sign a law forbidding prayer for 30 days uh, with the aim of Daniel being the appetizer, oh my, main course uh, and dessert uh, for the lions that were anxiously awaiting in their dens. But Daniel would rather not live then Dr. Beatty lived without being in constant communication with his heavenly father. Oh, friend, you and I need to know that the DNA, that's the scriptural model that will give us the AKA, that's the spiritual moniker of Daniel of old, is his communication. That's talking to God. That's prayer. Uh, that's fellowship with God. Oh, listen, almost this Monday uh, is Tuesday, and I dare say that there are those even listening to me preach tonight that have yet said a word to Jesus. If you treated your spouse the way you treat the Savior, you'd have been in divorce court years ago. His communication. His communication. His communication. Newsflash, you can get through your spiritual life without a cell phone, a laptop, an email address, or even without a social media platform. But sir, ma'am, you can't get through your spiritual life and neither can I without walking with God every day. His communication. Number four, his continuation. Daniel 6.10, and gave thanks before his God as he did aforetime. A dynamic of Daniel's daily life that made him a dissolver of doubts was his continuation. In Daniel 6.10, God tells us that Daniel comprehended that the only thing that gives weight to piety and purity and prayer and praise is consistency. The four words as he did aforetime are the secret to all of his spiritual successes. You just go through the book of Daniel and you mark them. You put a note in the margin of them about the successes of Daniel. And I'm here to tell you that every success that Daniel had, every success that Daniel had, every success that Daniel had was all because of that one word, a four time, a four time, a four time. Boy, if I had to put one word next to the name of Dr. Ron Beatty. I'd put a four time. If I had to put one word next to the name of Brother Les Butler, I'd put a four time. I hope if someone were to put one word next to my name, I hope that I might be in that league and some of you might say a four time. Dr. Bob Jones Sr. once said the greatest ability is uh, dependability. You want people to doubt the Bible? You want people to doubt whether God is real or not? You want people to doubt whether you're saved? You want people to doubt that old time religion is alive and well? Then you just go ahead 
and be up and down and in and out and hot and don't pop your head. Again, we're nowhere near closing in prayer time. Some of you look like you just got the swine flu. If you want to sow the seeds of doubt and discouragement, not just in the church, uh, but in the world too, you just go ahead and be up and down and in and out and hot and cold. And you know what that's going to be? That is going to be the exact uh, uh, antithesis. Uh, man, oh man, I'm preaching right now. The exact antithesis. I hope you appreciated that move. <laughs> That's three trips to the chiropractor. You better appreciate it. <laughs> oh, when you are hot and cold, when you are up and down, when, when you are in and out, that, that's not putting an exclamation point on all that we believe. That's putting a question mark on all we believe. A four time. A four time. A four time, a four time, a four time in good times and in bad times and times in between good times and bad times aforetime. Oh, many of us have watched uh, through the years Dr. Ron Beatty go through some of the deepest valleys and still rebound to the highest mountains. You know why? He learned a long time ago, aforetime. 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 Thank you, Dr. Beatty. Aforetime. 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 Boy, if we're going to be a dissolver of doubts, that's the AKA the also known as that I want to have. And to have that spiritual moniker you got to have that scriptural model and that is his continuation <laughs> and number five and last of all my time's gone my time's gone I'm out like Joe Biden in a legitimate election Oh, Dr. Hamlin, I, I wouldn't have said that if I were you. I know, I know you wouldn't have said it. That's why God had me say it. Because he knew you wouldn't say it. And while I'm on that, let me get on this. If you haven't figured out by now that Anthony Fauci is a political hack, you probably think that wrestling is real too. Uh, we're having more fun than a barrel of monkeys tonight. Amen. Number five and last of all, not only number one, uh, his uh, consecration and number two, his cooperation. And number three, his communication. And number four, his continuation. Uh, let me just ask you to place a, a, a mental bookmarker there uh, and allow me to say that when I was preparing uh, uh, Brother Butler this message, uh, I got to number five and, and I looked at one, two, three, and four. And I thought to myself, now, now these are all true because they're all here. They're in the Bible. But, but there's got to be one that, that just will make us uh, a dissolver of doubts. There's got to be this one. And, and so I, I'm just looking at the life of Daniel uh, and, and I'm studying the life of Daniel uh, and, and I'm, I'm just searching the scriptures. Uh, and man, I got number one, his consecration. And I got number two, his cooperation. And I got number three, his uh, communication. I got number four, his continuation. But, but I got to let you in on something. I was looking for soul winning. I was looking for soul winning. Because you know what? We're not going to dissolve doubts. Hey, we're not going to dissolve doubts. We're not going to dissolve doubts uh, unless we're a soul winner. And so, man, I looked again and I looked again and I looked again. Uh, and I knew, I knew, I knew it had to be there. And then, lo and behold, uh, the Holy Ghost said, yeah, it's there. Number five. And last of all, his consolation. Daniel 12, 3, and they that be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament. Amen. And they that turn many to righteousness as the stars forever and ever. A dynamic of Daniel's daily life that made him a dissolver of doubts was his constellation. In Daniel 12, 3, God tells us that Daniel of old comprehended that in the economy of eternity, the triune God put such an emphasis on evangelism that he likens those that are involved to being stars <laughs> that sparkle in the midnight sky. Brother Daniel 
people knew firsthand what the unknown poet was aware of when he penned. Is there anything else that is better worth as a long life's way we plod than to find some wandering soul of earth and bring him home to God? I would rather find a soul that is lost and bring him home again than to own what all earth's acres cost or all the wealth of men. Wouldn't I be glad when the day is done in breathing my latest breath to know some word of mine had won and saved a soul from death. Friend, you and I need to know that the DNA that will give the AKA dissolver of doubts of Brother Daniel is his constellation. The Bible says in Proverbs 11.30 the fruit of the righteous is a tree of life and he that with his souls is wise. Let me pause for station identification. Our brother shared with me at the book table that he's running for something and my brother when you shouted while I was preaching you got my vote. Anybody that would shout for old time preaching, I don't care if they're running for county dog catcher. You got my vote. It's a free political endorsement. I expect you to spend some money at the book table. <laughs> Don't miss this. Don't miss this. Don't miss this. Uh, the brightest stars uh, aren't seen on new movie posters, but are those that show up uh, for bus calling, uh, support churchwide visitation, uh, and still and still and still carry gospel tracts in their pockets and purses. Would you look at the text? Daniel 5, 16 and dissolved out. And dissolve doubts. And dissolve doubts. We're, we're not supposed to be putting question marks. But we're supposed to be placing exclamation points. And it is the scriptural model, which is the DNA, that gives the spiritual moniker, which is the AKA, and dissolve doubts. <laughs> During the coronavirus crisis, and by the way, let me interject here. I realize there's something to it. I do. I, I lost one of my heroes, Dr. Sammy Allen, to the coronavirus. And maybe you lost some loved ones to the coronavirus. I, I realize there's something to it. But on the heels of that, I have to say, that it has been exaggerated, it has been politicized, and now it's weaponized. And during the coronavirus crisis, which quickly morphed into coronavirus craziness, we had a mass mandate in Canton, Michigan, where Mrs. Hamble and I live. And I was to fly out of town for a meeting and uh, I thought, well, what I'll do is, I, as soon as I get back, I've got to drive to another meeting. So I'm only going to be home a handful of hours. And I'd really like to spend a little bit of more time at home other than having to run by the gas station before I leave town to gas up. So I thought, well, you know what? I'll just, I'll just get a little bit ahead of the game. Brother Butler, you know the routine. You travel. You know the ritual. And so I thought, here's what I'm going to do. I, I'm going to go ahead and get gas before I leave for the first meeting. So when I get back for that, from that meeting and go to the second meeting, I'll have the gas that I need and I'll get, stay, get to spend five more minutes at home. And, and you know, Sister Dorothy was right. There's, there's, no place, there's no place like home. Sister Dorothy said that. And so they still have the mass mandate uh, in Canton, Michigan. And, and, and I, I just got to say this too. Th those mass Nazis... That drive me crazy. I mean, they act like we're going on a field trip to lick doorknobs in Wahoo, China. Drive me absolutely nuts. Those mass Nazis. And, and on the heels of that, I got to say this too. Bless your heart, some of you, you look way better with the mass than. Well, I just, I'll just leave it right there. 
And so they still had, they, they still had the mass mandate uh, in, in, in Kent, Michigan. And so I, I'm going to go ahead and get gas before I go to the airport. So when I get back from that meeting, I don't have to get gas for the next meeting. I can just get in my car and head to the next meeting. And so I, I paid for the gas. And as I was paying for the gas, I took out of my pocket uh, what every believer ought to carry on their person all the time, a gospel track. And I went into the uh, Speedway there in Canton. Uh, Mrs. Hamlin and I used the same gas station. Uh, and I was paying for my gas. Uh, and I pulled out of my pocket a gospel track. And I handed that gospel track to that young man behind the counter. Uh, and he looked at me and he said, I know who you are. <laughs> I thought, wow. He said, I know who you are. Now, mind you, I'm, I'm wearing a mask. <laughs> I'm wearing a mask and I gave the fellow a gospel track and he, and he looked at me and he said, I, I know who you are. I thought to myself, man, he gets the sword of the Lord. He read that sermon of mine on the front page. Uh, he was blessed. He knows who I am. He said, I know who you are. I said, who am I? And with the mask on and his mask on, he said, that's your wife that's in here all the time that gives us those gospel tracks. I know exactly who you are. <laughs> She's famous. Not me. <laughs> but wouldn't you like to be known yes, sir. in the city that you live? Wouldn't you like to be known uh, in the community where you live for being one uh, that is like Daniel, oh my, of old, uh, a dissolver of doubts, a dissolver of doubts, uh, a dissolver of doubts. That's the AKA yes. that I want today. I'm closing with this. Back last year, November 2023, I had uh, preached Dr. Beatty on a Sunday night at the Metro Baptist Church in Belleville, Michigan. This would have been November um, 19th. And at the start of that service, the pastor, a dear friend of mine of many, many years, Dr. John Vaporzan, as he opened the service, he asked for testimonies of when people got saved and how long they've been saved. It happened to be the week of Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving would have been on Thursday. This was Sunday night. And I was preaching for Dr. Vaprazan. And he asked when he opened the service up, he said, now I wonder, uh, who has a testimony of when you were saved? And he, he said, I'll start. And he told about when he got saved. And my brother, so good to see you. Uh, two weeks ago, I was uh, in uh, Kender, North Carolina, and you came. And, and I mean, I don't even know where that was. And I preached there and you still came. And, and here you are again. Thank you, sir, for coming. Back to the message. And so, <laughs> and so he said, I'm going to tell how I got saved and how long I've been saved. And he told that testimony. And boy, I said, amen. That was wonderful. And, and then the second fellow that gave a testimony, first outside of the pastor, was up in the balcony. His name was Calvin. And Calvin stood. At, we're not talking about the bad Calvin. Amen. You know, if my first name was Calvin, I'd, I'd change it to like Carl. With a, K. with a K. That's what I would do. <laughs> Fell by the name of Calvin. He's, he's up, by the way, you'll get that about five o'clock tomorrow morning and you'll wake up and just say, amen. <laughs> but Calvin stood up in the balcony and he said, uh, boy, I want to thank the Lord for saving me. He, he said it was 75 years ago. He said, I want to thank God for saving me. Yes. 75 years ago. Boy, I made a mental note. It's not every day that you Meet someone that's been saved seven decades and a half. And so I just made a mental note to Dr. Vady that when the service is over, man, I want to find Calvin and I want to hear about how he got saved because Brother Butler, 75 years, Calvin up in the balcony said, I want to thank God for saving me 75 years ago. So before I could get to Calvin that night, Calvin got to me. And I said, Calvin, tell me about how you got saved. And he said, oh, Dr. Hamlin, he said, I was a little boy. And he said, uh, uh, I'd walk past uh, uh, our pastor's uh, office. And he said, the, the door opened uh, uh, and there stood uh, our pastor in the doorway of his office. And he called me to come into his office. And he said, uh, with, with a burden for my soul, he said, uh, Calvin, you need to be saved. And, and you need to trust Christ. Uh, and, he, and he took his Bible in his office. And as a little boy, he said, my pastor, with a burden, uh, led me to Christ. I said, wow, that's awesome, Calvin, and that's awesome. 
I said, well, I have known uh, your pastor. And he smiled real big. And he said, oh, yes, sir. He said, you don't know my pastor. He said, my pastor uh, was Dr. W.G. Moorhead. He said, Dr. Hamlin, I know you know who Dr. W.G. Moorhead is. He said that Dr. Moorhead was, was one of the men that, uh, <laughs> oh, I know it's coming and I'm about to shout. He said, Dr. Moorhead was one of those men that, that had helped uh, Dr. C.I. Schofield uh, with the notes in his Bible. I said, man, Calvin, that's great. And I got home later that night and I went and got my very first Bible, the one that Dr. Uh, Baby I was holding when I got saved and, and the one that the soul winner used to lead me to Christ, which just happened to be an old Schofield Bible. And I turned to that front page uh, and sure enough, there uh, on that front page, listed with the men that helped uh, uh, Dr. C.I. Schofield was the name W.G. Moorhead. I took out my pen. I wrote next to his name, P.S., which stands for personal soul winner. Now watch this. <laughs> 75 years later, Dr. Moorhead was not remembered for telling a little boy about the wheel, inside of the wheel, next to the other wheel, surrounded by the other wheel. 75 years later, Dr. Moorhead was not remembered for calling a little boy into his office and taking his Bible and saying, now let me just uh, unfold the mysteries of the ages. Amen. 75, some of you look like you're choking. 75 years later, uh, Dr. Moorhead was not remembered uh, for their telling that little boy uh, about uh, uh, this age and this dispensation and the other age. There's some folks, they've got dispensations God doesn't even know about. No, 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 a thousand times no. 75 years later, Dr. W.G. Moorhead is known for taking his Bible and leading a little boy to Christ because that's what it's all about. Not what does this wrinkle and that wrinkle and the other wrinkle means on the image of Daniel. That You know what those wrinkles mean? That dude had old toes. That's what it means. Hey, friend, what he's remembered for is being a soul winner. My mentor, Dr. Tom Malone Sr., Dr. Beatty said in my hearing once, when you with God in your life are used to win a soul, you've done a greater work than creating a world or hanging a star in the sky. His constellation the aka the also known as that I want today and dissolve doubts and dissolve doubts and dissolve doubts our heads are bowed our eyes are closed I wonder with every head bowed and every eye closed who could lift their hand and say, Preacher, tonight I know that I know that I know that I know if I were to die right now, heaven is my eternal home. I'm saved and sure. You'd lift your hand and leave it saved and sure. Saved and sure. Saved and sure. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you. you. May put them down. You're here tonight, dear one, and you couldn't raise your hand, but but you would lift it now. And by raising it, you're saying, I need to be saved. I need to trust Christ. Preacher, I don't want to die and go to a devil's hell. And right, right now you'd lift your hand and say, Preacher, pray for me. Here tonight, and as a believer. Somewhere along the message, God has spoken to your heart. And you'd say, Preacher, you showed me something that maybe I wasn't aware of or 
probably I just need to be reminded of. And I want to follow that scriptural model, the DNA, to get the spiritual moniker, the AKA, and dissolve doubts. You'd lift your hand tonight all over, all over, all over, all over. We stand to our feet, our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed, our sister begins to play. Heavenly Father, thank you. For the kind attention of these, my brothers and sisters. And Lord, I pray that not one in any way would grieve, resist, or quench the Holy Ghost. May this be a time of great and glorious victory. Lord, thank you for the example of Daniel. And I pray by way of his example, all of us will have been exhorted tonight to have that also known as that Brother Daniel had. In Jesus' name. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. Our brother by himself sings the hymn of invitation. Something you need to do why not right now? You step out and come. Pastor. I've wandered far away from God. Now I'm coming home. The pass of sin too long I've trod, Lord, I'm coming home, coming home, coming home, never more to roam. Open wide thine arms of love, Lord, I'm coming home. You know, I kindly perceive that down yonder in that underworld where tens of millions of people are burning and screaming tonight, there must be tens of thousands of them as they scream in the fires of hell, saying to themselves over and over, why didn't I go? When that invitation was given, why did I allow pride to keep me from doing what I should have done? When they were singing that invitation and I was heavy under conviction, why didn't I go? But all of the remorse for all of eternity cannot change the fact they're in an eternal prison house called hell. On the other side of that, there's millions and millions of people over in glory tonight who are shouting it out and they're saying, I'm so glad I went. I'm so glad for that first stanza when I stepped out. I'm so glad that they extended the invitation to give me another opportunity and I had enough sense to step out and go to that altar and get saved. Now let me ask you this, which is it going to be with you? Is it going to be for all of eternity? You're going to weep and wail, gnashing of teeth, screaming. And the tape recorders of hell comes on in your mind. And you're saying over and over again, why didn't I go? Why didn't I go? Are you going to be up there rejoicing with the saints of God in the presence of the Lord? Saying, I'm so glad. I'm so thankful that I went down and got saved. Which is it going to be? You see, here's the thing, and we're finished. Everybody tonight makes a decision. We either decide for the Lord or we decide away from Him. But everybody decides. And if you have a need tonight, 
and you don't allow the Lord to meet that need, you're the loser. I want to be on the winning side, don't you? By the way, I chose that long. I chose that as a teenager. I just decided since I'm going to, have to spend eternity somewhere, why not go to heaven? We're going to sing one last stanza. If the Spirit of God's speaking to you, and I perceive that He is, if the Spirit of God is speaking, would you come right now and let's get it settled.